Okay. Well, this morning, we're going to be kind of Bible hopping, and I'm not necessarily a fan of doing that, but it helps to bring the point of today's Christ likeness lesson together. But the principal portion of where you need to be is in Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to be talking about becoming a meek person. And as most of you can probably imagine, this isn't a lesson that necessarily sits well with me on an individual level. I don't like the thought of being meek, let alone talking to others about being meek. So I need you to understand that while I'm going through this, my focus is in the, on what the Bible shows us the example that Jesus gave us and what Scripture says we should and shouldn't do. Do not in any way take this lesson as uh, Cole Presley saying, this is how we're to act. Because in almost every one of these circumstances and examples, I'm pretty sure everyone in the room can identify Cole Presley doing the opposite. Primarily dealing with people who are aggressive in nature or choose to push attacks our direction, and how as believers we're supposed to handle that. And principally, that's why I've struggled with putting this thing together, because I, it's not been very long within just a few weeks that I've had to deal with this on a professional level, and I can quite assuredly tell you I did not handle it the way the gospel has shown us that we're supposed to. I'm not a take-a-punch guy. I'm not a take-a-punch-and-walk-away guy. I haven't ever been... Um, and I'm not sure that I'll ever become that guy. The problem is, we all know that when punches are thrown our, our direction without merit, they don't land. They don't. They don't. They don't cause harm. They typically make the aggressor just look more, um, more look like more of a jerk than they ever have before. Especially when claims are unbiased or, or, or un, not unbiased, but. Um, or without merit on their own, they just they miss their mark. But yet we still see it thrown in our direction and choose to act. And that has typically always been my nature, especially even as a politician, to do that. But to become a meek person is to become Christ-like. And we're called as Christians to not only follow the commands that Jesus has given us, but to be able to change our lives over time, um, rooting out those evil things of the world, rooting out that natural sin nature that lives within us to be able to shape our hearts, our minds, and eventually our lives to become a visible example of what it is Christ has called us to be. That is not an overnight process that occurs. That is not a process that occurs without pain. And that is not a process that occurs without failure from one point to another. And yet, we're still called to remain in Scripture and find those weaknesses in our lives, root them out, and change them. The fruit of the Spirit is the character of Christ produced by the Holy Spirit in our lives. This fruit has nine parts or components and is a trio of threes or a trinity of a trinity. The first three components are love, joy, and peace and concerns our relationships with God. If our, relationship with, if our relationships with God are right, we will have those three characteristics in our lives. The second trio relates to our relationships with other people. These traits must be present in our lives if we are to have happy, healthy relationships. They are patience, kindness, and goodness. The third trio concerns our relationship to ourselves and what kind of people we are. These components are faithfulness, gentleness, and most importantly, self-control. We come now in our study to gentleness or to meekness, the second component of this third trio. The word translated gentleness refers to power under control. Like a wild horse that's been domesticated, a gentle person is not weak, 
though we may see him that way. But very strong and able to control his or her emotions and actions. Gentleness also refers to a supernatural tenderness. To be gentle, we have to do four specific things. The first is that we have to tame our tongues. Has anybody here ever said something you wish you could take back? Ever in the heat of the moment said something, and the minute it came out of your mouth, you're like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Anybody married instantly knows that answer is yes. <laughs> Any teenager should also be able to recognize that that answer is yes. Sometimes we can be very harsh and even mean with our tone of voice that we use with our spouses, with our children, with our coworkers, with our employees. Gentleness means that we control our words. God tells us in Proverbs 50. 15.1, that a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. This should be viewed as encouragement to our speech. After 20 years of marriage, I am still affected at times by a gentle response to anger. I'm also provoked at a harsh response to A gentle word, though, has an awesome power that can turn away wrath. Being gentle with our words also means that we have a tenderness of spirit that prevents us from retaliating when we're hurt. What's our natural response when someone wrongs us? As much as I'm looking in the mirror when I give this message today, I know for a fact that there are some in the room that when they feel wronged, they're going to lash out. Sometimes as a parent, it's fun to just sit back and watch it work itself out. Maybe that's not the right thing to do, but I can't help but being entertained sometimes by these nonsensical fights that show up in my house from time to time. But our natural response is to say bad things to someone else, to cut them down. But if we're allowing the Holy Spirit to produce the fruit of gentleness... In our lives, we can obey the command of Jesus in Luke 6, 28. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. The word translated bless is the word from which we get our English word eulogy. It means to speak well of. If you have the fruit of gentleness... You'll be able to keep your words under control and say only good things about those who might seek to harm you. The fruit of the Spirit reproduces the character of Christ in our lives, and few things reveal His character like refusing to retaliate with words. How does Peter describe Christ's reaction to being insulted and beaten just before His crucifixion? In 1 Peter 2 23, when they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Our natural tendency is to fight back. Whether it be with words, whether it be with physical force, whether it be with action or retaliation, our, our natural tendency is to fight back at those who are causing us harm or who we think are causing us harm. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus took every one of those insults, didn't respond to every one of those insults, remained on the cross through every bit of that. A sure sign of an untamed tongue and probably the most frequent sin that we commit as Christians is gossip. I think it's called spilling tea now. I don't think we call it gossip. I think it's what's the tea on this, I believe. I'm getting smiles in the back, so I must be right. Yes? Okay. Gossip's one of the most harshly condemned sins in the Bible. Gossip is repeating the personal affairs of others for any reason other than to help them or to protect them. Proverbs 16.28 tells us that gossip separates close friends. 
Gossip can ruin the best of friendships and relationships. We love to hear about the shortcomings of others because it makes us feel superior. However, we can tame our tongues by daily praying what prayer, what specific prayer found in Psalm 141. Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Nothing reveals the fruit of gentleness being produced in our lives like how we talk. To be gentle, we must tame our tongues. We must tame our tongues and we must work to avoid arguments. Insecure or prideful people must always be right and prove it. When we are gentle or meek, we are inwardly strong and humble. We don't need to always be right or to prove our points. Whenever we get into an argument, we need to remember the truth found in Proverbs chapter 13. Pride only breeds quarrels. Based on that verse, when people are quarreling, what is the root cause? Pride. Pride is the absence of humility and the absence of gentleness. Gentleness is being even-tempered even and tranquil when most people would be quarrelsome. The Bible teaches that a fool is quick to quarrel or argue. Furthermore, in Proverbs 26, we see this warning. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you will be like him yourself. This simply means that if you get in an argument with a fool, bystanders can't tell which one is the fool. Becoming defensive and angry when someone disagrees with us is a sure sign of insecurity and pride. One of the key follies that occur there is those specific points of pride that resonate hard within each and every one of us as individuals. We all have those different facets of life that we cling to that are extremely important to us, that are points of pride for all of us. For every single one of us, as an individual or as a group. As fathers, there are points of pride within our family that our children achieve or don't achieve or specific points of their character that we're extremely proud of that we don't ever want to see attack. As men, as individuals, there are specific points of pride. Some of those might be character, but most often they're going to relate to success and work ethic. I stand up here even as a big guy who's not ready to go run a race anywhere, shape, or form. But calling me lazy is a fuse that gets lit that is a serious point of pride for me. To be called that will set me off faster than anything else. And I know it, and yet still struggle and will react often inappropriately when that's thrown my direction. If we know them in ourselves, if we know them ahead of time, if we know what will cause that trigger to be pulled, then we know ahead of time what facets of our life we have to learn to let go and put back in God's hands. Helping to eliminate those arguments. Avoiding those arguments means that we're strong enough to admit when we are wrong. The two most difficult words in the English language to say are, I'm sorry. The three most difficult words to say are, I was wrong. Gentleness gives us the courage and the strength to make those two statements and thus avoid some serious disagreements. To encourage us to admit our mistakes, what does God tell us in James chapter 5, verse 16? Here James writes, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other for healing. To be gentle, we must tame our tongues, avoid arguments, and we have to refuse to resent. Gentleness, gentleness means you're strong enough to forgive and not hold grudges. If you've been really hurt by someone, you know how strong you must be to forgive them. One day, Peter comes to Jesus and asks how many times he should forgive someone who sinned against him. Peter, perhaps wanting to be generous, asks up to seven times. But how many times does Jesus tell him he must forgive in Matthew chapter 18? 70 times 7. 70 times 7. Not 7 times. 70 times 7. How many of us naturally can't get to 7? 
let alone 70 times 7. Forgiving someone seven times seems an awful large amount. And yet Jesus commands us to willingly forgive. Some versions of the Bible might say 77. Others say 70 times 7. The Greek text could be translated either way. But Jesus is simply saying our forgiveness should be unlimited. Peter wanted a legalistic limit. He wanted a boundary. But Jesus answered in terms of love. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, the description of the limits of love show that love is not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered, and it keeps, most importantly, no record of wrong. It's an unlimited forgiveness. If we keep score, we have not really forgiven, which means we don't really love as the Bible commands. Remember, the first component of the fruit of the Spirit is love. If we don't have love, there's nothing to which the other components can stick. If we don't have love, there's no ability for the fruit of the Spirit to grow and to become abundant and to become measurable. To be gentle people, we have to tame our tongues. We have to avoid arguments. We have to refuse to resent. Finally, we have to pursue God's purpose. Gentleness includes being submissive to God's purpose for our lives. Gentleness accepts God's will without complaining or resisting. The greatest biblical example of this kind of gentleness occurs right before Jesus was crucified, or at least the night before Jesus was crucified. Knowing the horrors that were waiting him the next morning, what did Jesus pray in Luke chapter 22, verse 42? Lord, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet, not my will, but yours be done. Here we see a reflection of Jesus' thoughts right before he went through the horrors that he did for each and every one of us. It clearly displays he didn't want to physically go through all of that. He dreaded every bit of that and yet still put himself in a position uh, to become that sacrificial lamb for us because it was God's will and not his own. Sometimes it's God's will for us to go through very painful experiences. And it may simply be for the benefit of others, but to prepare us to fulfill His purpose for our lives or for the development of our own characters. To be gentle persons, we must tame our tongues, avoid arguments, refuse to resent, and pursue God's purpose. The lesson closes out pointing to what areas need the most improvement in your life. And what do you do about it beginning today? Beyond the lesson, I look at each of these steps that need to be provided or need to be achieved on an individual level, and they almost need to be done in order. You can't avoid an argument if you've not learned to tame your tongue. You can't refuse to resent people if you can't avoid getting into arguments because arguments breed resent. And you can't pursue God's purpose if you're not willing to hush, avoid quarrels, and focus on what it is that God's wanting, wanting us to do. Almost guaranteed, there's someone that we've encountered within our lives that we may be in a position to influence towards Christ. But if we can't stop resenting them, if we can't avoid arguing with them, if we can't stop seeing them as an adversary, how can we ever show them God's love and God's forgiveness? It's impossible to do. It's impossible to do. And in that sense, as believers, we have to see ourselves as being the barrier for their own, for their own salvation and not ours. We make individual choices to believe. But if we display ourselves in a way that is not Christ-like, how can someone else ever be in a position to see God's love and God's forgiveness? 
Those actions matter. These processes are not easy. <laughs> I'm fully well aware of how difficult it can be to tame a tongue, to avoid an argument. And I'm fully well aware of how difficult it can be as individuals because of our own sense of pride to forgive. And yet that is what we've been called to do as believers. The final point showed <clears throat> Jesus' mindset prior to being put up on that cross. And it becomes important that we remember not just that He willingly did so, but that we remember the sacrifice involved with that as well. And that's why today this lesson matters as we're scheduled to do the Lord's Supper today. So what I would like to do is close in a prayer focused on seeking forgiveness and seeking a changed heart to weed out those areas of our lives where we're so quick to anger, where we're so quick to want to get in an argument, when we can't help ourselves but to speak and to put our hearts and our minds in a better position to truly remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. Let's pray. Father God, this morning as we consider what it is 